Start in Your Yard presentation, a program of Northern Kane County Wild Ones. I am Roland Lauer, treasurer and member of Northern Kane County Wild Ones. Um, and I just wanna say a little about myself. A large portion of my yard is native plantings. Uh, we began converting our yard to native plants 25 years ago, and we can't imagine our yard without all the year round visual interest, pollinators and wildlife it attracts. The Wild Ones is a non-profit advocacy group committed to promoting the use of native plants in landscaping, gardening, and land restoration. About 18 US states have Wild Ones chapters and there are six chapters in Illinois alone. I would like to thank Gail Borden Library for hosting these events. We couldn't do it without them and for your participation. Our Start in the Yard and Community Read program is built around Doug Tallamy's latest book, Nature's Best Hope. This book lays out a path for each of us to improve our neighborhoods by planting native wild plants in our yards. Dr. Tallamy is a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware and has written several books linking the health of humans on our planet to the health of pollinators and the native vegetation that supports them. His book and this series provide information about how to use native plants in any type of yard and the benefits to ourselves and our neighborhood by doing so. I encourage you to visit the startingyouryard.com website for more information about where to get the book if you don't already have it and to watch the tell me presentation that he gave here in Elgin last year. Also on the startingyouryard.com site, you'll find a complete listing of all the community read sessions such as this one today in a few days. You can also register for those other sessions that are coming up and also watch the video of those that are in the past. The Northern Kane County Wild Ones meets throughout the year in Elgin. We host programs with guest speakers monthly and we also host tours of native gardens. Here are a few of our upcoming meeting dates and topics. Because of COVID, our recent programs have been virtual, but we will resume our yard and garden tours in better weather and with in-person meetings and presentations when it is safe to do so. We also are hosting a plant sale or an annual plant sale where you can buy native plants and shrubs at very reasonable prices. One good reason to join Wild Ones is that as a member, you get an early chance to order plants from the sale before the general public. We sell dozens of varieties of plants. Be because you are attending this session, you, there will be a follow-up email from Zoom that contains a certificate that you can redeem at the Wild Ones plant sale in May. Okay, today it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Jim Kleinwalker. Jim is a well-known member of the staff at the Conservation Foundation. Uh, he's the program for program director for conservation at home. This program assists people making changes to their landscape that help retain and cleanse water and create more habitat for wildlife. The highly prized conservation at home sign in your yard signals cooperation with nature's ways. Jim has visited hundreds of properties to do evaluations and provide assistance he is extremely knowledgeable about how to move forward from wherever you are in changing the landscape to be more eco-friendly. Today, he will be looking at what kind of landscape did we displace with our farms and then our neighborhoods. Although Illinois is a prairie state, this particular part of the state was largely oak savanna. What is an oak savanna? Where can I experience one? Might it be, good, might it be a good model for planting natives in my yard? Jim will bring his vast experience to answering these questions and providing ideas for what plants to use if you want a mix of sun and shade in your yard. There will be time for questions and answers after Jim's presentation. And now I will turn it to, over to Jim who will start. Thank you, Roland. I work for the Conservation Foundation. We're a not-for-profit land trust and we do all kinds of things, pretty much everything environmental across the area. We work primarily in Kane, Kendall, Will, and DuPage, and we're being pulled into Grundy, LaSalle, DeKalb counties to the west. We work with partner organizations, so if you were in Lake or McHenry or some other county, 
um, we can still help you there. Our main office is on the McDonald farm in Naperville. It dates back to the 1870s, but we've upgraded it with green infrastructure is what they call it. The solar panels, wind turbines, um, two different rainwater harvesting systems, wetlands, green roof, you name it, we have it there that you can come see it. So um, that's one thing you could come down and, and visit to see some of these plants that we've um, put there for um, show. And why I'm out there doing this is because if we look at your community and you want it to be better, we have to look at private property owners. 95% of the property in Illinois is private. So if we want any county to be better, any city to be better, we have to function by engaging everybody, all the landowners, park districts, everybody. <laughs> There's this book by Stephen Keller called Birthright, and it explains that we won't be healthy and happy if we live apart from the environment that which we evolved. And that couldn't be more true. Um, here I'm hiking in the Appalachian Mountains or guiding my son to his first big muskie. We, as human beings, it's not that I'm a nature guy. We all have this in us. And where do we go on vacation? I went to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, we fly away to go to places that are more nature oriented. And if we can bring some of that into our yards, we're going to do better. Nature is a healing force um, for many different things. And a lot of the problems we've incurred with our own um, bodies have been because we are separated from nature. So the fresh air, the animals, we're connected to that. We are animals. And we use animals and plants to cure the sicknesses. We're drawn to be near water and to be near other animals. If you're part of a garden club or you work in your yard, you know what um, strength and uh, happiness you feel for getting out in the dirt. And it's not odd because we're made of so much of water. So we work with people to how would you engage that? And we're now up to about 3000 homes across the region, eight different organizations working together. I think it's about 30 different counties in the state of Illinois that we work in. And this dot map kind of gives you an idea how they're scattered across the region, even into Wisconsin. Now we're up into Lake Geneva area and we have an organization in Michigan. So people are doing things in your neighborhood and around your county, and we're trying to connect them all together and connect with the forest preserves and the park districts to make a network of more green space. We do the same thing with corporate sites. So it wouldn't matter if it's not your home site, if it's where you work, where your kids go to school, um, churches, parks, doesn't matter. We can implement these same conservation measures that I'm gonna talk about today. And Part of it is understanding how we need to connect things. So we need to um, maintain and plant the right things. So you've chosen to purchase a home in Northern Illinois at this particular time. So what we're advocating is we embrace the plants and animals of Illinois when you're here. If you move to Arizona, you'll be talking about cactus. In Illinois, we're talking about prairie and oak trees. So one of the concepts people don't understand is there are good trees and bad trees. And there are, you can rank them. And in the Talamy book, he ranks them from best on down. And the number one tree is an oak tree. So there's more, it's called a beneficial services or it's called ecosystem function. What, what does the tree give back to the environment? and oak trees live to be two, three, 400 years old. They have um, hundreds of different critters that use them. They can be used for furniture and um, firewood and all kinds of things, even after they're dead. So it's clear, um, and if you read the Talony book, um, he's, he's ranking it by not beauty, but by function. 
And in this first grouping are trees that we don't haven't planted enough of. Diversity is really what we need in our tree species. We've had in the second category, we've had problems with ash trees most recently, them getting wiped out by the emerald ash borer. Before that, it was elms got wiped out by the Dutch elm disease. And we're over planting maple now and honey locust. Uh, um, alarming rates, how much we're planting those two trees and we're gonna put ourselves in the same type of situation if we don't diversify our tree species. And um, in the category at the top are some of the ones that we could easily plant more of. Some of the trees that we have planted have become um, invasive, including honeysuckle. Bradford pear is going to be listed as soon as an invasive species or a calorie pear is another name for it, but they're a, a non-fruiting pear tree that they came up with and they're starting to spread across um, native areas and they will shade out other trees and cause problems. So with the oak trees, you know, the numbers are astounding. Um, 543 different types of moth and butterflies alone that doesn't count the ants and beetles and all the other animals and 60 different bird species and um, a variety of mammals like um, deer and mice. And um, so you see they're number one, but their populations are declining. They're, we're not getting regrowth of the oaks and it's a problem. Grass is part of it. I'll talk more about that later. And there are things that we could plant that would be better for the environment than turf grass. Turf grass was never meant to grow around the trees. So when I'm out talking to people and they tell me that, if you can see my pointer, this is a beautiful oak tree and they love it and they want to protect it. Well, the best thing they could do would be to get the grass off of the base of it. Even something simple like when the tree drops its leaves, this is food to improve the soil, to add organic material to the soil. But we can't leave these leaves here because they would kill our precious grass. So you see things like that. Um, oftentimes the root systems will send up roots to the surface because they can't, I think there's one maybe right here. They don't breathe well underneath the sod and they don't get enough water and air movement. So the roots come up, you maybe hit them with the lawnmower if you've seen that in your yard. That's an indication that the tree's not happy there. It doesn't kill the tree directly, but it weakens the tree to the point that sometimes insects get in it or large branches crack off because it's not in a strong position. So, you know, there's a lot of different things like this trillium that you could plant underneath the tree that would be open, but turf grass is not a good thing to have. So um, it's the competition for water and air nutrients that the root systems need from the tree. And according to people like the Morton Arboretum, they would like to see it all the way out to the edge of where the branches reach. Now, that may not be something that you wanna do, but removing as much as you could would be better than having the grass come up to the base of the tree. Also, part of the thing with the regrowth of these oaks, when these oaks are dropping their acorns, this would allow a place for the acorn to take hold. If they fall in the grass, they're not going to survive because of the lawnmowers going over them and so on. So in order to have healthy oaks, we don't want just one big 200 year old oak. We want to have some five-year-old and 10-year-old and 50-year-old and a variety of oaks coming along at different ages. This is what a Naperville, uh, at the Naperville Park District, what a natural landscape might look like. So you're seeing the little white flowers are spring beauties and there's bluebells over here, but without the turf, these trees are doing very well. And I'll show you in some other pictures, but you can tell that this is the oak savanna by how far these trees reach. They 
in a forested area, trees would go up trying to reach the sunlight. But in an open area, they will reach out. And looking at these trees that are, oh, these are at least 100 to 150 year old oaks here. And you see how wide their branches are. We know that they were growing in a savanna. And a lot of times I get people saying to me that, well, nothing will grow under these trees. And that's not true. It's just a matter of we've put the wrong things. We can't grow grass. We shouldn't grow grass. But what could you grow? And here in this picture, you're looking at wild geranium. Then, you know, you think of geranium as being a red plant that's on your patio and you it dies every year and you have to replant it. Well, the mother of all those geraniums, the wild geranium is a perennial and it will spread with these pink flowers across woodland areas. This is woodland phlox. This is celandine poppy. And the arching one here is Solomon seal. So there's some beautiful things. Sedges are popping up in here also. Beautiful things that can grow in our oak woodlands. I'll show you more of those. So instead of doing this turf, especially around these big trees that we want to keep, and many times people show me their oak and it might be just one oak in the middle of a large area. That's probably not how it was. So your house, there may have been an oak right where your house is that was cut down. And now this big one sitting in the middle of the area all by itself. Um, and this is clearly in this picture, this is a, a planting along a roadway. But judging from the age of these, they may have built the road next to the tree, not plunk the tree in next to the road. So these trees may be far older than um, than the roadway is. So a lot of the oaks are gone and they're not regenerating. And so we're promoting and educating people about how the oaks are so important and they're not just a tree, they become part of an ecosystem of plants and animals that live in these oak savannas. And I'll talk more about what the savanna is, but if you look at these pictures that I'll show you, they're open areas and a lot of sunlight hitting the forest floor. And so you get this um, growth underneath the trees like this. And notice it's not turf, but with the sunlight coming in, you can get all of this nice growth. Same here where you can see there's just scattered trees and there are trees and common shrubs that connect with each other in these oak woodlands, such as the ones I've listed on the left, dogwoods and redbud and um, elderberry viburnums that would grow in these things. And they're companion plants. So it, we know that they grew like this for thousands of years and putting them back around an oak you may have are just, um, it's pretty much guaranteed it's gonna be something that would work. But you're again, you're looking at the limbs pulling out and these savannas, it's not a forest and it's not a prairie, it's in between. And there are certain plants that thrive here and the term is called a biome. And that means a family of plants and animals that are different. So it could be things like a desert or uh, the tundra are all examples of groupings of things that function together well. And there are birds and animals that love this um, area that's partially shaded. So it's a good place to hunt for fox and coyotes. Um, bluebirds love it. Turkeys, woodpeckers, a lot of different things will live very, very well in a savanna. So we want to keep these semi-wooded areas as much as we can. Spring is the best time when the sunlight comes in before the leaves come up on the trees. These savanna areas are just absolutely beautiful. So in the next month, I urge you to walk in the woods. The bluebells haven't come up yet or they're up, but they're not blooming. 
Uh, this morning, I saw Trillium and Wild Leek and Bloodroot and Solomon Seal coming up. So these amazing wildflowers are going to start their show. You can see the trees. Uh, this is my daughter sitting in the woods. She would kill me if she knew I was using her photos. But you can tell by the bubbly bark on these trees that they're hackberries. But you can see again how the sunlight streams in in the springtime and you get this big um, pop of the spring ephemeral um, wildflowers. So take pictures of what you see and um, you can contact me or Roland or any of the other people that um, to find out what they are and how you could implement these for your yard. It's important that we layer. So it never was a situation where there was a one big oak tree over turf grass. So there should be a big oak tree, the canopy, your shade trees. Then there would be an understory layer of shorter trees, the shrub layer, and then the herbaceous layer at the bottom. And different birds use these different layers and uh, the sunlight comes in differently across these layers. So it's important to have a layering concept just like what was there previously. A lot of the understory areas now are covered with invasive species like the honeysuckle and buckthorn. So one of the strategies there would be to take them out. Also in our wooded areas, these savannas, a lot of times they have what they call an ephemeral or vernal pond. These wet areas that water puddles in the woods and most of these habitats have been drained and subdivisions put into these areas. And this is a critical habitat for amphibians, primarily frogs, uh, salamanders, newts, other things like that, um, very critical habitat. They don't do well with fish. So these areas, if you went there in June or July, they'd be dry. It's not a habitat that can um, sustain fish. So it's perfect for these amphibians and a lot of that is gone. So the amphibians are hurting. So we want a diversity. Oak hickory is the number one forest in the state of Illinois. The beautiful shagbark hickories that we have are bitter nut hickory. Walnuts, you know, again, diversity in these woodland areas, but look at the sunshine hitting the ground. Even on a sunny day, you want, even in the middle of July, you'd like somewhere in the range of 40 to 50% sunlight still being able to come through. So these dense, thick woodland areas are not particularly um, fruitful. And the savannas that we're talking about with sunlight coming in are much, um, better habitat for most of the creatures. And when I'm at walking these properties with people, a lot of times they're saying, I thought you were going to help me with my woods. And I say, well, I am. And they'll say, well, you're saying cut down half the trees. And a lot of times the trees fall into these category of these invasive um, species that have come from other places like honeysuckle and buckthorn burning bush, the Bradford pear we talked about earlier, um, ground covers like Euonymus, Finca, English ivy, things that people brought over with good intention, multiflora rose, they brought it over with good intention and it's gone crazy in the United States. This picture I'm showing you here is garlic mustard. It was brought over as a salad um, garnish. So it can be used, cut up and used in, in salads. You can uh, people make pesto out of it, but it's gone crazy in the woodland areas and in the savannas and it uh, inhibits the growth of other plants around it. So it's, it's a nasty one. We need to get it out. Certainly um, the recommendation would be to pull it out when it's flowering or before it's flowering. After flowering, it goes to seed and you don't want to have next year's plant. It's hard to see it here, but this one is flowering, it will drop seed. Last year's plant is here, won't flower till next year. 
So there's, you know, even if you pulled out all the ones from this year, next year, you're going to have a, another batch of them that you have to keep pulling out until you can get to a point where you've got them all out. And this is what we want the woodland to look like. So there's in the foreground here, there's may apples and the wild geranium. You might see trillium in here, um, open areas that the sunlight streaming in and these native plants can take hold and um, it, it can be just breathtaking. So look at some of these other woodland areas and how nice they can be. Um, Dutchman's breaches, there's white trillium, um, woodland anemone, bluebells again. So we try to get people out in the woods too. So um, as many times as we can, we bring people out and introduce them to things and help them see, get a vision of what their yard is and how it could be if they were to make a change towards the eco-friendly side. And there's a lot of benefits that we can get. So in these pictures from the farm, we're growing Monarda bee balm right by this pear tree. So people want the pears, but the connectivity of knowing that these flowering plants are gonna actually increase the productivity of your tomatoes, of your peppers, of your squash, because the bees are here every day. And so when the tree needs pollinating, the bees are already right here. So these things that I'm telling you can bring productivity, sustainability to your yard and look pretty at the same time. So it's a win-win situation. We would do the same thing on park district sites. So a lot of areas are not suitable for ball fields. I saw a mink swim across here when I was up on the, I'm taking this picture from a bridge and the mink swam across here and how pretty these natural areas are when they're free from the invasive species and um, been maintained. The low areas that were wet, they can be planted also. If we were gonna be planting trees in these low spots, you'd use sycamore, river birch, maybe bald cypress, and the plantings underneath it, it would be called a bioswale. So instead of a ditch that was there that was just a mud hole, we now can plant these and they absorb the water and, um, and it doesn't run off into the streams and rivers. So when I'm talking to people or I teach at College of DuPage, we're talking about simple things. Nothing in this list is scary. Nothing you're gonna say, oh my gosh, I can't do that. Um, because they're basic things and they're gonna make things better in our yards. We kind of know uh, intrinsically that putting artificial chemicals down is not a good thing. Um, I'm talking about how grass is not a particularly good thing either. Our soil has been degraded in many cases and planting trees of diverse species and quality species is gonna be a better thing. So you, where you start with all of this is that the sun is the power of this planet. And we have nothing here if it weren't for plants. So plants are not just decorative things. When you think about plants in your yard, you can't think about the fact that oh, I like this because it's pretty or you have to understand that there is function and life and inside the house, you wouldn't think of just having pretty things, you know, plastic, flowers or a vase, you need the functional things like the microwave, the stove, the refrigerator, the couch, the bed. You need those function and then you can decorate around them. In the landscape, we've lost that and we just put, oh, this is pretty and we, we lose the function in our landscape. So with this picture here, you're looking at a hummingbird if you don't have hummingbirds, it's because you haven't put in things that are attractive to hummingbirds. They're not coming for a cup of coffee or conversation. They're coming for food. They scan your landscape and 
If there's nothing there, they don't go there. So kind of understanding the connectivity of our landscape is going to drive the types of species that will come to our properties. And it all goes back to evolution. We understand evolution in the animal world. We understand a turtle carries a shell around with it, that the cheetah can run fast to catch the gazelle. The giraffe has the goofy long neck to eat the acacia leaves, but we don't see it in these plants. They hide their things below ground. This is the turf grass we've been talking about right here. And that was brought to the United States from Europe. It's typically credited to um, Thomas Jefferson. So at Monticello, he wanted to have turf. It was very expensive and he had to have a whole crew, a landscaping crew to take care of it, but he didn't care. It was a sign of wealth. And from there, we now have it everywhere. Look at the root systems on the native plants. This is an actual root um, ball and shows you the height and depth of of how the plant would be. You can see where the ground would have been right here with as much or more below ground as above ground. So it's one thing to, to promote native plants and it's another thing how we can make them look pretty in our landscapes. So this is the things I teach about if we clump them, they look more organized. Shorter is better than eight foot tall. Spacing between them makes it look purposefully planted. We can use rocks and logs, so on, to decorate around them. You might use less species to help you identify them and weed around them. We certainly um, promote having pathways so you can move around the property. And a lot of these plants thrive in a variety of conditions. And anybody that tells me they have a brown thumb and can't grow anything, well, I will challenge them to put in these native plants that have been here for 10,000 years. And if you put the right thing in the right place, it's more than likely going to work. So if you were sitting on your deck looking out at this natural area, notice the rocks and the logs but there's not any turf grass in this picture, but you can recognize things like fence, bird baths, bird feeders, and they've used clumpings of plants to make it look organized. And I show people, you may not wanna get rid of your whole backyard, but if you did, some people are doing it and, and they love it. I went and saw Carol and Doug at their house one year and they asked, what is this tree here? And I said, that's a honeysuckle. Well, what's this one? I said, that's a buckthorn. And they all should come out. And they were like, oh, that's like 90% of our trees. This is a shagbark hickory back here and, and these oaks. And I told them, well, you know, do the best you can, start working at it. Well, it was about a year later that Carol called and she says, we're done. And I said, what do you mean you're done? And she said, yeah, we're done. That Doug bought a saw and a helmet with a light on it. And he was out there uh, deep into the night, many nights. And she had to call him in to get dinner. And um, he was on a mission and they had cleared it. And uh, in the, the sunlight now coming back, in here, it caused the whole growth of these native wildflowers that have sat there dormant for years and years. We found all kinds of things popping up in the savanna. So this is a true savanna. And I told her that now you wanna get a bluebird house out there. And she said, Jim, we've been here for years and years, never seen a bluebird. And I said, well, you never had a savanna. And we laughed and in comes this bluebird and flies right past us, lands on the fence. And she said, did you have that in your car? And I said, no. So we put up some bluebird houses now. She has nesting bluebirds on the site and they've achieved their sign. Um, so changing these habitats has some positive benefit that you're gonna reap. Now, he, yes, he had to do a lot of work, but they're very happy with the changes that they made. 
part of the thing that I can sell really easy is birds. 50% of the bird count was in these four species. I'll talk about these. Uh, this is an invasive starling from Europe. This is an East, um, English sparrow and grackle. Um, so a matter of these four, look at the colors now versus the ones that you want to have come in your yard. But these understanding that most of these birds do not eat seed for their main food source. And even the feeder we put out for the hummingbird, what the hummingbird is getting from the feeder is sugar water. And that's similar to me drinking a Pepsi. It may give me a short boost, but it's not sustainable food source. So these birds are looking for bugs is what they eat. And the native plants, um, if you read Talamy's book, he talks about the, the native plants host the native bugs. The native birds eat the bugs, and these birds are what people want. This grouping of birds won't even come to a bird feeder. In most cases, they're strictly bug eaters. Some of them will switch to berries later in the summer. The cedar waxwing, the bunting, tanager, and the oriole will switch to berries late in the season, but they need bugs for their young. And some of the birds, like this bluebird, 100% bug eating. Now, they're the snowbirds. They can't stay here in the winter because there's no bugs for them to eat. So they fly south and they're gonna come back looking for those bugs again. And again, if you have them on your property, if you have the plants that host the native bugs, I can bring these to you just like we were doing a recipe for a chocolate cake. You'd read the recipe and you will end up with the chocolate cake. If you don't do the recipe right, you're not going to, it won't be right. Same thing with the butterflies. Um, there are some beautiful plants. This is Blazing Star, and there's a variety that will go in the sun, the shade. There's a Savannah Blazing Star for the partial shade areas, for example. So how would we implement any of these things? And the first thing is recognize a poor landscape when you see it. And what could we do to fix that? Again, with we make it a path, so get people into it, and you plump these plants, beautiful flowering things. This um, prey drop seed here is a short grass. And you increase the look, you've increased area for pollinators. This indigo is a beautiful one to be growing in a savanna area and very attractive to a variety of pollinators. So how would you implement conservation practices on a home? So these people called and they, they don't have any shade trees. They don't have any birds, no butterflies. They have problem with water. These two downspouts pour out and drain across the sidewalk. And the problem is the sidewalk is lower than the landscape, the grass here. So how do you fix this? These old overgrown arborvita here, you lower the landscape down. So the sidewalk is now higher than some parts of the landscape. The water can be directed to go away from the sidewalk into these planted areas. You now can have birds and butterflies coming to these areas, a defined area of grass with a sharp um, edge on it and it looks prettier and is more functional than the prior landscape. Backyard situation, we have an area for the children to play, probably spraying this with some kind of herbicide, but they've mitigated the problems of the herbicide washing off into the streams by putting these native plantings and there could be beautiful trees out here if you wanted to put red bud or something that would bring view to the outside of the house. But these cone flowers, this is obedient plant, big blue stem, and uh, the native sunflowers out here in the prairie away from the house. Up by the house, we have clumpings of black eyed Susans, cone flowers in more organized setting than the prairie look out here. Traditionally, what we have in our yards, all you have to do is Google it if you want to know where it came from. 
And these plants, for the most part, including turf grass, have very little to no value to wildlife. So they're strictly ornamental. They're pretty things. And grass, I would argue, is not even that pretty. But things like lilac, roses, would fall into that category. And I'm not saying don't have them. I'm saying understand that they're not functioning. They will not bring the birds and the butterflies to our yards for the most part. And they're just sitting there as dormant as a plastic gnome or a block of concrete, that they're not engaged with our environment. So we try to sell the the pretty native things, you know, the turtle flower, turtle head, um, milkweeds are some that we need to plant more of. We all know about the monarch, all the beautiful milkweeds in there. There are milkweeds that grow in the dry, ones that'll grow in the part shade, wet, you name it. With the geese, we've done this, you know, when we were kids, you saw the geese flying in the V's in the spring and fall. Now they're here all the time. We have these areas in our, in your homeowners association or in your park where you have eroded shorelines, you have grass up here. You don't want to have a picnic with your kids here. You know, it's loaded with goose poop, probably herbicide because there's no weeds here. The big fat geese, they want to walk into the water and they're looking for a view. They are deathly afraid of fox or coyote or a dog and they want to be able to see it long before it gets here so that they can get away and the better landscapes would be one that you know would not cause erosion and would be diverse and flowering so geese are gone in this picture they'd have to fly in and fly out they don't want to do that they'll go somewhere else we'd have heron in the water and we'd have fro frogs and crayfish and a variety of birds, finches and things eating the bugs that would be in these native areas. So is this something people have an understanding about if you lived in these homes that understand that this is a functioning landscape versus one that didn't work? And you see how I took this picture, it just made me laugh that somebody was actually mowing the lawn during a drought when there wasn't even any grass to mow and the dirt balls were just flying through the air. We, you can see, I mean, by side, you know that there's no root system and we're doing the wrong thing by dumping high amounts of nitrogen on our lawns. It's not good for our trees and it's not good for our grass even. It's, um, the grass can't handle that much nitrogen. So you've paid a lot of money to put something on the lawn that's gonna make it grow faster on the top. Only the blade of grass grows. It's not good for the root system. And that's really not what you want. So we're doing the wrong things and it's causing damage to the environment. We're covering the United States with grass. All the green states are states that have primarily grass. And grass does zero for wildlife and we spend $40 billion annually on a non-productive surface. So how can we encourage trees and nice plantings when we're covering 20 million acres with this non-native surface? So I show people left or right, which one's prettier? That orange that you're looking at is milkweed. That is the Asclepias tuberosa, the butterfly milkweed. And one side's blooming in the middle of a drought. One side looks, you know, burned and the other side looks beautiful. And yet, what do we cover the United States with? So it doesn't make sense. And there are alternatives. We're promoting a pollinator mix for these sun areas. And this is what it would look like across um, large areas. We've been sold it to the toll road authority for the back slopes along the highways. So there are a number of books. I've talked about Doug Tallamy's book. Um, his first book was Bringing Nature Home, excellent book. He's got um, new books out. 
Um, I like the Midwest Native Garden one um, by Charlotte Edelman. She, in this book, will help you um, with choices. So if you have hosta, she would tell you what would grow in an area similar to hosta that would be natural and have um, wildlife benefit. Um, and um, Pat is uh, a local resident in Elgin. So we have people right in our area that are very educated and knowledgeable about native plants. So what we're doing with the Conservation at Home program is uh, we can help you with brochures. Um, Roland talked about plant sales that are coming up this spring. I can help you with plant things and we even go to their homes. Tomorrow I'm spending a day going to a bunch of different homes to walk the properties and give people some hands-on um, advice on their property and lists of plants that they might find to help them. And then if you want to contact me directly, my office phone and my email address. Um, the visits that we do, all of that is free, no charge. We hope that you'd want to join the club of Conservation at Home or Wild Ones. They also have a, a beautiful programs to educate people. And the idea is um, you're going to get help without a charge. And if you want to go further and join us and be part of it, then you'll get even more support with all the different plant sale things that are going on. So with that, um, I will take the questions. I don't know if I can access them or. Well, Jim, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll ask you some questions that came in. Okay. So, uh, Corey, someone asked, how is grass with its short roots bad for trees? I'm all for planting hostas or other shade tolerant plants, preferably natives, but aren't they also competing with the tree? The, the difference is um, turf grass is a matting type grass. So if you buy some sod and you see how it is so thick, it is like a tarp. So it is so thick and dense that it does not allow air and water to go through. If you looked at bluebells or wild ginger, the root systems are not nearly as dense. So do those plants compete slightly? Yes, but they've evolved together so that they don't negatively affect each other. There's, there's terms that are like, say, parasitic would be a, a, a plant um, or an animal that eats off of another one, like mosquitoes bite us in order to get blood so that they can live on. These plants are, are symbiotic. They live together and they help each other. So the native plants that have evolved together actually are good for the tree. And the turf grass that is not from here is, is bad for the tree. I hope that is understandable. Yeah. Okay. Um, what can be grown over a septic field? There's a bunch of controversy over that. I haven't seen any issues with growing native plants over a septic field. You can read both. If you Googled it, you're going to find somebody says, no, don't do it. And other people say, yes, I've done it for years. So I'm not going to, um, you know, let you do your research on that. I have not seen any problems. Um, similarly with other native plantings, the absorption of water is not a problem. And um, the septic tanks are not meant for surface drainage. The water goes down below ground, not, um, not up. So there's certain trees you would not want to plant there, like um, willows are like the worst. So I think keeping trees out of the area would be a good thing. But um, the herbaceous plants, I have not seen it to be any kind of negative um, impact. Okay. Thanks. So aren't Arbor Variety native to Illinois? Why cut them out? Arbor Vita? Yes. Um, they're not native. And 
in that picture, in that particular thing, I don't tell everybody to cut down all the shrubs they have, but in that particular case, they were planted so close to the house and they were, had gotten so big. So many, many times I go to someone's house and there's an area between the sidewalk and the house, for example, and they put a bush that, um, I, the one I saw this morning was a burning bush and the burning bush, if you look it up, I mean, it grows to like 15 to 20 feet tall and eight to 10 feet wide. Well, it, it can't get eight to 10 feet wider it would take the whole sidewalk away. And if it went as where it's normally growing to 12 feet high, you couldn't see out the picture window anymore. So this many times these trees and shrubs are planted in areas where you, the only way you're gonna keep that there is by vigorous pruning all the time. So it's not a sustainable situation. So over the years, those trees have grown out of control and in that instance I was talking about, the only way was to take that out. So there's a lot of things like Arborvita that provide winter for the birds to hide in in the winter, it's evergreen. There aren't a lot of evergreens that are native here, only white pine and jack pine would be the only true evergreens that are native to Illinois. So I'm not against adding some things or if you have something like boxwood or something that the birds are using to use for structure. Um, but many times they're 20, 30 years old and they don't provide any function anymore. So in that case, I tell people, if you don't like it, then take it out. Okay. Yeah, and I guess like you had mentioned, it depends on the, how much function that plant or tree is providing. Right. So here's an interesting question. Is there any data on resale value slash desirability of homes with native planting slash gardens and or with greatly reduced or decreased gray, grass and lawn? I read some um, about, they were talking about green um, things in general. So I've just recently put solar panels on my house. And I think 10 years ago, if you had solar panels that were visible from the street, that was a negative thing. Now they're saying that it's um, neutral. So some people will like it, some people will don't like it that you have solar panels. And, but the trend is that it would be eventually in a few years, it's going to be a positive thing on your home sales to have these green infrastructures. So these rain gardens that we put in, they actually help flooding in the yard. So if you could show people that these things are functional and it's going to stop your basement from flooding. And the key there is they have to be pretty and pretty is some somewhat subjective, but we know how to do it. All the landscapers, you know, if you bought any kind of plant or had a designer put it in, they put in three or five of a certain thing, clumping and space between them. So there are ways to put the native plants in that will be every bit as pretty as something else. Okay, great, thanks. Um, which liatris can tolerate shade? The most shade tolerant one would be Liatris scariosa, the savanna blazing star. And it's difficult to get, but we have sources for that too. And if you couldn't get something there, you know, um, the swamp milkweed is really, um, an easy to grow plant and it will take shade also. So if you couldn't get one, there are other shade varieties that could be used in wet um, or shade in the same family. So if anybody wants to get that uh, Savannah Blazing Star, I will be getting some for our plant sale, but it is um, Leatris scariosa. Okay, thank you. So here's one about trees. After the white oak, which oak species is best to plant? And what size oak sap sapling is best to plant for success? Okay. It the, the variety of oak would depend on the, 
on the conditions. So a white oak or a bur oak are big trees that reach wide across the yard. So we're suggesting on those that you have 20 feet uh, or more in any direction from some obstruction. So 20 feet out from your house, 20 feet out from a power line. If you don't have that kind of space, then you pick a different type of tree for that location. If it's wet, then you use swamp white oak. Um, red oak is an easier one to grow, doesn't get quite as wide as the burr or the white. I have a hills oak that I've planted in my house, in my yard, and it's, it's a smaller variety of oak. Pin oak is a very tall tree, but not as wide. So again, thinking of the location of it, I would think about which variety of oak that you might want for that site. And what was the second part of that? Uh, what size sapling or tree? Oh, we found that the five gallon pot, the tree is about four foot tall, is a, is a really nice size to plant. Homeowners can pick it up themselves. They can dig the hole themselves and put it in the ground without um, having to hire a backhoe and heavy equipment. And it turns out that the trees will catch up to each other. Even if you put a small one in, there's less shock to that tree by putting the small one in and it grows faster. So oftentimes if you put a small tree in after five years, the small one and the big one are the same size. So you pay more for a big tree, but it's so hard on the tree to be bald and burlapped and moved in a truck and um, that many times it, um, it grows slowly for a period of time after that. But a lot depends on what you want. If you want something quick, boom, I want, a, I want a tree there tomorrow, then you can buy these bigger varieties that give you some um, size to it right away. Yeah, and some people have mentioned that oaks grow slow. Is that true or is that they're setting down their roots and then all of a sudden they speed up? You may have alluded to that maybe. They're slower than some um, varieties, but there's there's also a um, a correlation between fast growth and life. So if you planted a, the the most wicked ones would be a willow, they'll grow like four to five feet every year, and then they die in about fifteen to twenty years. So these oak grow oak will grow a foot a year, which I don't think is you know bad. And they will live to be 100, 200, 300 years old. We've got a slice of a 313 year old oak on our on display at the farm. So, you know, long after you plant it and your kids and your grandchildren, and the people will be enjoying this tree for, you know, the next hundred years. And you can't say that with a, a bunch of varieties of trees that are out there. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question about trees. Uh, if planting an oak and two red buds or dogwoods, how far apart would you plant all of them? Will they all do okay in full sun? They will do fine in full sun. The oak is the most important one because it's going to be the biggest one. So keeping that um, a distance from sidewalks, houses, things like that would be the key that I would think about first. Secondly, you put in your smaller understory trees, whether it be pagoda dogwood or redbud or those other um, associated trees with it. And, you know, some of them are, do better in some shade. Um, so depending on the size that you put them in, you don't always have to plant them all in the same year. You could put in this one first and then add to that planting over a period of time. But um, I hope that answered that question. And you can always write to me with specific things if, if it didn't answer it. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, another person asked, my son, or says here, my son loves toads, turtles, and frogs, and would like to build a small pond in our yard to attract them. 
is it possible to make something approximating the seasonal wetland you mentioned that is perfect for reptiles? Yes. And what you would do, you'd, you assess the situation in your yard. Hopefully there's a wet area already and you lower that even more. You can, um, if you dug a, a depression, you can line the depression with like a rubber mat. So the places we work with Aquascape in St. Charles and they will sell this heavy rubber mat that you could make a pond liner so that it would hold water even more and create um, that puddling even later in the summer. So if your soil drains quickly, the rubber mat might be needed. If you have more clay, then it may already hold water as it is. But making shallow depressions in low areas would be how you would go about that. And then planting it up with rain garden species that like wet areas. It'd be difficult if it was a high dry area and you're gonna to try to keep water where it isn't naturally being. It, you know, all of it, it, it kind of comes back to what is the natural way. And if you're kind of following the natural way, you have a high degree of success. If you're trying to do something that is again, you know, like trying to make water run up the hill or something like that, we're going to have trouble. Yeah. And also it depends on how much you want to dig. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Any thoughts on sweet gum trees? Are they native to Illinois? And same question for Catalpa. Catalpa is native. Sweet gum, I don't think is native um, this far up. Some of the, you know, with global warming, some uh, are planting things that were not typically here. Um, the Morton Arboretum is kind of saying that plants that were in uh, Southern Illinois or Kentucky um, may be good here now, but I'm, I still think our trees are pretty resilient. Um, I love, if you go to the Possibility Place Nursery, they're down uh, near Joliet. They have a wonderful website with all the native tree species and detailed information about how big it gets and um, what kind of situation it likes with the soil conditions, for example. So that would be the, um, the local tree catalog that I just love. And I can help you if, if you can't figure out how to get trees. They even now are mailing trees to you with UPS. Okay. Um, is it safe to grow ash trees now? And has the emerald ash borer moved from the area or will it come back? Um, not safe. And I don't think anybody is selling ash trees yet. They're working on some varieties of ash that would be resistant, but at this time, it's still a no. Okay. There's plenty of other trees, diverse trees that are nice that we can switch off to. All right. What about having a compost? How does that affect oaks if you have one close by to an oak tree? Compost pile? Yeah. Um, you wouldn't want it right underneath the tree for a variety of reasons, but I highly suggest using compost piles because a lot of the leaves that we have are that organic material and even the things out of your kitchen are wonderful organics that we need to add to the soil. So we have hard packed clay and the way to combat that hard clay is through additional um, organic material. So I would highly suggest putting in a compost pile. Um, if you're going to have kitchen scraps, then you get one that is a cover on it. We're gonna be selling um, earth machine composters that you can see on our website and you cover that kitchen scrap one because you don't want raccoons and other critters eating the kitchen scraps. So um, if it's leaves, you can have them open like uh, pallets or in a little fenced enclosure, but it, that compost is excellent. You wanna get it out in the sun. The one reason why you wouldn't put it underneath the tree is the sun is gonna heat it up and help break down those um, 
bacteria that will help the bacteria grow and it gets hotter inside this container and that helps to speed the process of the compost. Okay, so the compost pile, don't put it in the shade, but use it under the, in the around the tree. Not around it. Yes. Okay. Shred your leaves up, um, mow the leaves and blow them back near the tree where the tree can use them. Just don't, um, I didn't go into mulching. If you do mulch, you know, this volcano mulch is what they call it, where they pile it up against the trunk of the tree. You don't want to do that. You want any of the leaves and um, organic material away from the trunk. Okay. Um, somebody asked, and they know it's slightly off topic, but is it, it's um, their understanding that rain barrels are not suggested anymore. Have you heard anything about that or? We sell rain barrels. We're up to 14,000 rain barrels um, and we highly suggest them. So some people think that the material coming off the roof is toxic. Um, I have not seen any evidence of that. Um, back in the day that they had asbestos shingles, it would have been different, but now the material that they're putting on the roofs, um, at the farm we have metal roof. So there's really no material coming off the roof that would be toxic. Um, some people, if you want, if you were worried about it at all, you'd not put it on your food. I haven't seen that as a problem. We do put it on our food um, gardens, but you could certainly use it on um, plants, uh, other flowering plants and different things around the yard. So we highly suggest rain barrels because the rain is better than chlorinated tap water. Oh, okay. Good to know. Um, so the rain barrels and the compost, they were at the Conservation Foundation site, correct? Our website, and we have a big sale that will be in uh, Kane County at the, I think it's the Kane County Fairgrounds. I'm not absolutely positive, but we do have a Kane County distribution of both rain barrels and compost bins that I can make sure I get to the wild ones and you can um, put the link in and send it out to people. Okay, thank you. And on the startinyouryard.com site, a lot, any of the links that you've referenced or in any of the programs, we'll probably post them there also. Sure. Um, I think that's all the questions. So thank you, Jim, for this, that great presentation. And all, to all your participants, you will get an email coming from Zoom that uh, can be redeemed at the Mail Wild Ones plant sale. I would like to, again, to thank Gail Borden Library for hosting all these presentations and helping us plan and publicize the community read. Thank you also to the Wild Ones for their donations to allow Tell Me's books to be sold at such a big discount at both Al's Cafe and Arabica Cafe in Elgin. I don't think we mentioned that earlier, but you could buy Doug Tellamy's book at those two locations, Al's Cafe and the Arabica Cafe in Elgin. And thank you all for attending and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.